Good morning, and I'd like to thank the organisers uh, very much indeed for inviting me to this very august event. I should say that we were talking about lone nuts earlier. Well, I'm not lone. My graduate students will attest to that, but I'm definitely a nut, and just ask any of my graduate students and friends and, and colleagues. And uh, this is my rather pathetic attempt to introduce some uh, meaning into, into my work, is to look at sustainable uh, energy in the form of solar power. So, um, so does it matter where you are? Well, as it happens, in uh, com combination with TEDx, it's an in international event, and in sympathy with that, I, I was actually born in Borneo in the Far East. I spent the first 10 years of my life there. Uh, my father wa was out there um, when the British were, were in that part of the world and helped create the, what is now the state of Malaysia. Uh, I moved when I was 10 or 11 back to the UK, but in the process, I liked um, being in hot countries and hot places. And indeed, the bridge, that rather rickety bridge that we saw um, in the previous talk, I crossed many of those <laughs> when I was a child and thoroughly enjoyed it. But now I'm back in Europe and I run a, a project um, called Destiny, um, which is training um, the future of the graduate students to uh, understand new forms of solar power in the form of desensitized solar cells. I'll come back to that. Now, my project runs al across a lot of different countries, and so, uh, so what we've got here is, uh, so I've got groups in Spain, in um, Israel, in Greece, and in Italy, which is absolutely brilliant going to all the meetings in these places. We also have groups in Oxford and, and Bath and in North Wales. But the point, I, in fact, I want to make about this slide is that I've often heard it said, in fact, the government uses it sometimes as an excuse for not funding solar power. They say, Britain is a cold and wet country. But the fact is that there's only a difference of about a factor of two. I got this information from the same source as that slide between the, the really hot places, the Sahara Desert and, and, and Bath. So you shouldn't despair, and you shouldn't listen to people that tell you that Britain is not the right place for solar power. And the new types of technologies that we're developing will indeed help this um, application, because the silicon cells, which we see on every roof, including my brother-in-law's roof, in fact, much to my amusement, my brother-in-law is almost evangelical about solar power, because he's got it fixed up, and he sees the feed-in tariff and, and the, the meter clicking in, um, how much money he's saving. <laughs> Um, so, 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 and he keeps saying, why don't I have it? Well, the answer is because I know solar power is going to get a lot cheaper and a lot more interesting in the next few years because of the research that I do. <laughs> Who knows? Let's be the optimist. Uh, did I say something about being a nut? Anyway, so what is a solar cell? Well, it's just a, a rather pretty uh, panel there, and we've all seen these things. Um, and what you do is you, um, you, you so you, you shine the, the, the light, the solar radiation on these panels, and they generate electricity. They generate current and voltage. And um, this is a, a solar farm, and uh, you can, you can take the solar power is in direct current form. You have to transform it to alternating current, and then it contributes to the, to the grid. Or you can have use the, the direct power directly um, to, to charge mobiles and, and, and uh, batteries and, and the like. So um, what's happened about solar cells is very interesting uh, recently. The conventional solar cells are made from this uh, very pretty um, monocrystalline silicon. It was offshoots of the silicon that people used to make silicon chips. But computers got strangely popular in the last 10 years, and the consequence was for, for solar cells is that they got more expensive because the offcuts got uh, rarer and fewer. But the um, Chinese um, developed some very, very clever ways of manufacturing silicon, which is good enough for solar cells, but is, is polycrystalline, so it's much more broken up, as you can see. But, but they, they have these huge factories, they, and they generate uh, silicon, which has very efficient solar cells, about 30%, um, but uh, an order of magnitude, a factor of 10 cheaper. And so this is why, fortunately, we don't have to rely on the government fiddling or otherwise with the feed-in tariffs. The solar cells are becoming cheaper anyway. But we want, sorry, we want flexible cells, if I can just get this back to the... Um, Yep. Silicon 
is not flexible. You've seen these things, they're in glass, and they have to be at exactly the right angle to work properly. Now, um, my husband is Danish, and uh, last year we visited this um, event called Your Rainbow Panorama, um, and it was created by an artist, and what it is, is it's a gigantic ring sitting on top of this uh, art museum in Aarhus. And you can see inside that you can wander around, and you've got these wonderful colors. Now, we can make solar cells that would turn this whole um, edifice into a power generator, because we can make them flexible, and we can make them all the colors of the rainbow. So what are these types of solar cells? Now, I'm a physicist through and through. I told you I was a nut. Um, and so um, I'm interested in the different types of solar power and how they generate, um, how they work. Now, um, I run, um, in, in addition to my um, European project, I run um, a UK-wide project on different types of solar cells. We're training, again, graduate students. And some of my colleagues are making these thin film solar cells. It's a very, very beautiful picture um, uh, taken at University of Cambridge. And it, in fact, it's won an award. And what it shows is that these um, solar cells are made of these very, very thin films. I mean, they're thinner than a human hair. Um, and you make multiple layers. And the point is that they're much better absorbers of light. And therefore, they're much more efficient than silicon. Silicon is ubiquitous. You know, the sand is made out of silicon, but it's um, very poor light absorber. So you use different semiconductors, and the, you can get much thinner um, cells. And these cells are so thin that you can make them flexible. But you pay a price, um, they start to delaminate, and that's what's going on here. In, literally, the cell is degrading because the layers are separating from each other. And this is a problem with all the types of solar cells that I'm uh, interested in, that they degrade. I mean, we all degrade, but unfortunately, solar cells degrade somewhat faster th than we do. So the, the type of solar cell I'm interested in is the dye cell. So now I'm going to pray. I'm not particularly religious. <laughs> see if this uh, demonstration works. Uh, it, so this is a dye-sensitized cell, and what it should do, there we go, it's just, it's, uh, if I just put this to the front, and so this, this cell is in the process of degrading, which is why it's not terribly efficient, but you can, can you see the, um, let me just put this, can you see the fan, uh, if I put that there, can you see that running? And so, so, so now my point is, this is not magic. This is that solar cell is generating that power. Um, if I take it away and hide the light from it, it will, at the moment, it's just got some momentum. But if I, if I, if I black it, blacken it out, you can see that it's, it's slowing down. So, so this, this is a, 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 sol a dye-sensitized solar cell. Um, it is flexible. You can see that. Um, and these cells will become... Um, you uh, again, ubiquitous. The point is that they're very beautiful things. I mean, this is, I like beauty, strangely, I'm really for physicists, but I do. Um, this is actually, this, this um, picture, there we are, sorry, I'll wait for, thanks uh, for the slide to come back. Um, anyway, the picture shows um, the contents. The, the cell is made at the microscopic level of things called um, nanotubes or nanoparticles, and the nanoparticles absorb the light. Are we going to have the? Sorry, we're going to have the slide back. It's, it's taking its time. Um, and the nanoparticles are coated with dye, um, and it's the dye that absorbs the sunlight and generates the charges, which then create the current that flows through to create the, the, the solar cell. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll just. Um, I'll see if I can. Um, I'll just. Carry on. So th there's a <laughs> I, I've been there. I've been there. Um, plastic solar cells is another type of solar cell that I work in, and they are the same bits of plastic, very similar plastic to what's in those ma uh, those Evian bottles that are on your desk. Um, and they, you can also generate power from these things. Again, very very cheap. And th the idea is to make cells so cheap that you can use them in the developing world. And one of the firms in the uh, consortium, the UK consortium that I run, is called 819 from Cambridge, and they're developing uh, solar power uh, for developing countries. Um, 
so what I want to talk about here particularly is um, uh, that uh, Neil McGregor, <coughs> who's the um, director of the British Museum, gave a very inspirational series of talks on the radio um, about a couple of years ago. And um, he was, it, in, his t in his 100 objects, which are the history of the Western world, he included a solar-powered lamp and charger. And he made the point that by dint of cheap, portable power, such as you get from solar power, um, you can use it to charge mobiles. Now, mobiles in developing countries are used as a form of banks, okay? They transfer credit around and use these to, to, to create, um, the, uh, as I say, you, you, can, you can transfer money. Um, so the farmers in these very remote places, long away from, far away from any grid, they all have mobiles. Um, and so they can use this as a financial transaction. So that revolutionizes the local economy. Um, Neil McGregor also made the point that these um, solar power can replace kerosene lamps. Kerosene is incredibly dangerous. Um, you just knock it over and the whole house or small hut can set on fire. Um, it's also, kerosene is also very expensive. So the kids can't do their homework because they rely on these kerosene lamps and, and you know, their parents can't afford the kerosene for them. And also people get poisoned by them, now carbon monoxide and so on. So the beauty about solar power is all of that goes l almost literally out of the window. And we can have these cheap um, uh, solar and reliable off-grid power, which will hopefully allow the kids of the future to read their exercise books. I wish my own did a bit more, um, but we <laughs> uh, the kids in these countries are much more motivated sometimes. Um, but they, we, they can read the books and, 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 again, generate the capacity that they have in, 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 in developing countries. So how am I going for time? I'm OK, good. So. Um, I'm working, my recent passion has been a new type of solar cell. In fact, there was an article about these solar cells in The Guardian only 19 hours ago. Um, they, I like to be topical. Um, and what, um, what they are, it's a very similar to the dye cells. Uh, although the inventor of Proskite solar cells, who's a, who's a friend and colleague of mine, and in all my various consortia, Henry Snaith, um, insists that they're quite different from dye cells. He used to work in dye cells. But the point is that they, well, um, they're inorganic semiconductors, for those who are scientists in the audience. And they're made, they have this rather, rather, beautif rather beautiful lattice structure, which consists of these octagons. These octagons are of chlorine or iodide ions, and it has lead in the middle. Um, now, they're fantastically efficient, these things. Um, they went from 3% efficient about two or three years ago up to 16% um, this year. Um, so they're attracting a huge amount of attention. They're cheap to make, and you can make them semi-transparent. Now, um, I work with a lot of colleagues, including um, a group at Swansea, who, uh, in fact, provided the solar cell I was just demonstrating. And Matt Carney um, produced this lovely um, photograph which shows, as he nicknamed, the graveyard of ambition. It's easily found on the web. He, he also won a prize for that. And what that is, is the proskite solar cells that he made that didn't work. Okay. So this is why scientists like me um, and Matt and all my colleagues, Henry, and I could spend the rest of the day enumerating the many people active in this area. But anyway, they, we all have these frustrations, but we do the research to try and make these things work. And as Matt said, even though that's the gra <laughs> graveyard of ambition, it was his words, um, do you learn by making mistakes, and you, we, we will learn to make uh, better cells in the, in the future. Um, so now, what do I do? Well, I'm a theoretical physicist, and people find this rather odd, because theoretical physicists should be people who write equations. Well, I can write equations, but this isn't the time or place, and it's much too early in the day for equations. So what I want to do instead is illustrate what I do, um, and I'll see if this is going to work with a... Uh, with a uh, there we go. This is um, an animation which was created by my youngest son, Alex, and we're all very fond of seal pups. And we've seen seal pups um, moving around on rocks, and they move around in a fairly random way, as you can see. 
And so this is like a charge, an electron, okay, moving through a solar cell, certainly the disordered solar cells that I study. And you can see in a fairly random and haphazard fa fashion. And then uh, along comes a fish and... Ah, the one happy seal pup. Okay, so what has all this got to do with um, solar cells? The answer is that charges behave in exactly this way <laughs> in a solar cell. And the reason we have to study them is that you lose a lot of current. They're inefficient because, like tidal, the, the charges, the electrons combine with, um, with other charges, or they, they, they change energy states, and they disappear much in the way that sial, the fish you can regard as being another type of charge called a hole, along there it comes, and the, the fish and tidal combine and both disappear. And so um, my work is generating the paths for these charges and trying to make, make sure that the, it's slightly less random than tidal the pup. Okay, so that's really uh, enough um, about that. I would like to acknowledge the people that really do the work, which is my graduate students, which is um, Alex Daniels, who's now working on plastic solar cells, Timo Peltola, who's working on the perovskite cells, Dan Staff, who's been working on the dye cells, and Ed Wright, who's been working on the plastic cells. I've got a lot of um, partners in crime, um, particularly Laurie Peter, um, and Petra Cameron, and, and Aaron Walsh, um, and Federico and Adam are fellows on the European network, Destiny, um, and uh, we would uh, just have been a little bit fortunate in securing a few quid from various sources, and I'd like to acknowledge those as well. Thank you very much.